everybody, I'm Al Rochelle, and in this segment we're going to talk about what is dysautonomia to me? Not to me, but to Dr. Glenn Cook, who joins us right now. Doctor, thank you for stopping by and talking with us. Give me a little bit about your history about and what you're involved in with dysautonomia, if you would. So I'm, I'm a neurologist for the United States Navy. I currently practice at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, mm -hmm. which is where I did my neurology residency. And after completing residency there, I did a fellowship in the clinical neurocardiology section at the National Institutes of Health. And after finishing that fellowship, I did another fel fellowship in clinical neurophysiology and have since been in practice for the Navy. I run an autonomic disorders laboratory and clinic at Walter Reed in addition to running the neuromuscular clinic there. Wow. W were you one of the first ones to kind of get involved with this process? Because as we talk about dysautonomias, which I know is a blanket term, it's something that I used to cover medical stories. I don't even remember it 10 years ago. So, so I was really fortunate as a resident, we already had an established autonomic testing laboratory at um, what was previously the National, Mil the National Naval Medical Center. Okay. And then when Walter Reed Army Medical Center and National Naval Medical Center merged, that lab remained at the new Walter Reed. Okay. And it was as a third year resident that I started going into the laboratory saying, what are you guys doing in here? Let me, let me start reading studies with you. Uh -huh. And uh, so I started reading studies with the staff in there and became very interested in the topic, very interested in the physiology. And I said, this is what I want to do. Oh, wow. And uh, that, so that, that's really what pulled me into the field was, was that exposure and then becoming interested in the physiology and then recognizing the huge unmet need in the patient population. Yeah, so what kind of dysautonomias? And again, as we refer to this, it's a blanket term. It's not necessarily a diagnosis, but in all syndromes, it kind of puts it into focus a little bit. So what kind, what, what kind of forms do you deal with of dysautonomias? So we, what we see most commonly in our, in our clinic, the most common diagnosis we see is POTS postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Mm -hmm. And then this, the second two most common diagnoses that we see are small fiber autonomic neuropathies and vasovagal syncope. And I know we're going we're gonna to talk more about yeah, the we'll terminology that, right. yeah, yeah, sure. of that. So, so it's, it's recurrent vasovagal syncope, small fiber autonomic neuropathies, and POTS are the most common diagnoses that we see in our clinic. Now, as you look at, your, at, at the patients you've been dealing with, I mean, is it, it all over the spectrum, or does it seem to narrow down to a certain age group, or what? In, in the POTS population, there is a large predominance of young women. And, and that's, mm. true, that's true of autonomic clinics across the country. Otherwise, the spectrum of our patients does really span genders and age ranges. Now, I, because you mentioned it, I've, I've got to ask, why young women more than men? Um, or do we know yet? We, we, we don't know. We have some ideas. Um, there, there definitely appears to be a hormonal component um, that, that drives the increased incidence of POTS in young women. Um, we, we think that there may be a larger role for autoimmune disorders causing some of the problems with POTS, and there's a signal that indicates that that's the case for many individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and many autoimmune disorders are more prevalent in women. So that, that may be an additional reason why. So uh, when you're staffing up a clinic or a lab or, some, or whatever terminology is used, what kind of people do you have to have that are part of that team? Because again, with dysautonomias, it's, you know, it's the holistic look at it. so many things. It is, and, and just like anything else in medicine, it really does take a team, and, and it is a team effort. I have great nurses that I rely upon. Um, for, for our autonomic testing laboratory, my, my autonomic testing technician is key to what I do. Mm -hmm. And so we have, a, we have a well trained technician who has been doing autonomic testing for years now, um, and, and so he is, he is integral to oh, our boy. work. Now, what kind of measures do you use to determine if this is, in fact, some kind of a dysautonomia? So our, our lab runs a pretty standard battery of autonomic tests. We do a quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex test, a okay. QSART. Uh, so we're looking at that evoked sweat response. We do a heart rate response to deep breathing. We do heart rate and blood pressure responses to Valsalva maneuver. And we, we do a tilt table test with the non-invasive beat-to-beat blood pressure measurements. And we'll be talking a lot about that tilt table because when I got involved in this project, knew nothing about it until the author of the book that we've been talking about here, I go, a tilt table can determine something as serious as that? Right. Wow. And so that, that's a pretty standard battery of tests that, that we do. 
Um, for certain cases, we will do blood draws where we, we do venous blood sampling to look at plasma catechol measurements. Mm -hmm. So the neurochemicals involved with the autonomic nervous system, we find that very helpful in some cases. We don't do that as part of our standard regimen. Yeah. Uh, like, like other clinics, we rely on ancillary tests from a lot of our colleagues. So, so the, the parameters that we test in our lab aren't the only parameters that can be measured. Yeah. Um, autonomic dysfunction can involve the gut, so we rely on testing from our gastroenterology colleagues. It involves the urogenital system, and so we rely on testing from our urology colleagues that can be very helpful for informing certain cases. Because dysautonomias are, are, are fairly new in terms of what we know about them, do you find that as you explain, and even as part of the AAS, when you explain to people what's going on, it's kind of like a light bulb going on? Or is it kind of like, I had no idea that this was going on? It, it, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that light bulb, because I see that time and time again um, with, with physician colleagues, other health professionals, medical students, and with patients. And, yeah. and that is abs that, that's one of the most rewarding parts of my job is seeing those light bulbs go on and people suddenly realize like, oh, I, I, I understand the physiology and now I see what's going on with this patient or with me if I were talking about a patient. And now we can have some idea of what to do to make things better. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, that we, we do see that and, and, and like you mentioned, part of that comes with the, the fact that dysautonomias have not largely been taught in medical curricula uh, Why do you think that is? Decades. Is it because it's, it's so difficult? I, I think the difficulty, the complexity is part of it. You, you look at the, the wiring diagrams that we draw of the autonomic nervous system. Oh yeah, I've system. looked at some of those diagrams. Right. And Unbelievable. Pe <laughs> people look at those and just want to throw their hands up in oh, despair. Gosh, and yeah. up. Uh, I, I think that that's part of it. People just say, this is just too complex to even sort out. Right. Um, and, and I would respond to that. Actually, when you break it down, it, it, it can, it is, it's digestible. Right. It, 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 it makes a little bit of sense. It at least. does. It does. I think the other the other big factor that contributes to the 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 decrease the the lesser focus on education of dysautonomias is, is the inter interdisciplinary nature. Mm -hmm. uh, in in Western medicine, to a great extent, we exist in silos. You're some type of ologist. Boy, I have heard that silos comment a lot. Okay, and I, and I think it's we need to break down those silos because the autonomic nervous system spans the entire body. It mm -hmm. spans all of the ologists in medicine. <laughs> All in one, yeah. So, so I want to get two pieces of information for you. Number one, uh, the most helpful piece of information you could give a physician that might be watching this video right now, what would that be? Listen. To the, the patient. The, the advice is listen. Most of the time the patient's going to tell you what's going on. You may have to help the patient along with, with asking the appropriate questions. Mm -hmm. Our number one diagnostic tool in medicine, not just autonomic medicine, but our number one diagnostic tool in medicine is the patient history. Yeah. We have to ask, we have to take an appropriate history. And, and that sometimes that can't be done in 15 minutes, too, can it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and that's a very important point that, that is, is broader than just our conversation here. Uh, and one that I think is very, very important for us as physician leaders to recognize that Thing, that doing good work takes time. Right. And you oftentimes, especially in a patient with a chronic medical condition, you can't take an appropriate history in 15 minutes. Yeah. You can't teach a patient and family appropriately in 15 minutes. So again, now we, that was the, the, we were talking about the physicians for the patients themselves. What, what would you say to them right now? And what, one of the messages we've heard a lot is be patient. Although you know, when your whole systems are going on, being patient is one thing to say it, it's another thing to do it. My, my, the, my advice would be don't lose hope. There is hope. That, that's what I would tell patients. I, I, would, add, um, I would add something that a, a prior patient of someone that I respect and admire in this field said about him. Yeah. That one of his patients said, I knew my doctor would never give up on me. Oh. And so what I would say to our patients is, we are not going to give up on you. Oh, that's great. That, that's the message I want our patients to have. Don't lose hope. We are not going to give up on you. Dr. Cook, thank you so much. And, and congratulations and good luck in all of your work. Thank you so much for being here and, and allowing me to be here. Oh, I'm having fun. I'm enjoying this very great. much. Thank you, sir. Great.